That's a very interesting question. One might say that's not accurate if they support abolition. On the other hand, the cause of abolition was that yet a plank on a major national election as an important issue in 1842? Not particularly, no. So his claim about the Quakers is perhaps a partial truth, that they are not as politically active as one might expect some of the, quote, extreme abolitionists, but it, I think it's partially false. The Quakers support abolition, and to call that non-political seems to me to be quite questionable. So then he says he respects the motives of rational abolitionists who are actuated by a sentiment of devotion to human liberty, though I deplore and deprecate the consequences of the agitation of the question. Now take a look at that sentence again. Let's examine that closely. I respect the motives of rational abolitionists who are actuated by a sentiment of devotion to human liberty, although I deplore and deprecate the consequences of the agitation of the question. What kind of sense do you make out of that? I respect the motives of rational abolitionists, but deplore and deprecate the consequences of the agitation. You mean he admits that he's that thinks slavery is not great, so he's fine with like the quaint people who think just in terms of ideas and generally that it's not okay, but when they actually begin to like get upon the logistics of abolition, that's where he draws the line. Yes, the logistics, meaning when they act, when they agitate, when they do something, that's when he has a problem with it. That's a, that's a re remarkable statement. Yep, Sam. It's a hard sentence sort of to get your head around. It makes some sense, but. I, I would go a step further. I think that it's like a backhanded compliment. It's like, I feel like it was a bit demeaning to say that, you know, I think that you're well-intentioned and stuff, but I think that uh, you're not really realistic. What you're doing is a bad idea. Yes, yes. And this is Clay, all throughout the speech, Clay has played the hand of being someone with a superior and wiser knowledge of the consequences of certain actions. That's the position he has taken from the beginning to the end, that he understands what will happen if this occurs. And at the same time, he has also played the part of a seemingly humble, private citizen, very polite, wanting to accept hospitality, willing to offer it to anyone who comes to his home, not wanting to be argumentative, suffering the indignity of this petition, and recommending to the petitioners to be more like the Quakers, who in this case he paints as being quiescent and non-political. Then I think the last paragraph can basically be seen as a kind of peroration or conclusion and now, Mr. Mendenhall, I must take respectful leave of you. We separate as we have met with no unkind feelings, no excited anger or dissatisfaction on my part, whatever may have been your motives. And these I refer to our common judge above, to whom we are both responsible. An appeal to a religious judgment go home and mind your own business and leave other people to take care of theirs. Limit your benevolent exertions to your own neighborhood. There's pretty strong language actually right at the end and it's saved for the end. So he's telling Mr. Mendenhall here at the end, you know, it's not your business. So let's pause just for a second absorb this speech. It is a speech given in defense of an institution that is reprehensible. But it is a speech that is crafted with a remarkable amount of skill. Yes? 
Yeah, it is. And it is a speech that casts Clay himself as being a wise interpreter of the probable results of certain action in society. Is that what people look for in a leader? Sure it is. Because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We want actually someone to be able to have some insight into the likely results. Is this a speech about appearances? Are appearances involved in this speech in some kind of way? You bet they are. The petitioners are one kind of appearance, along with Mr. Mendenhall is their part. The Quakers are another kind of appearance. The laws of one state versus the laws of another state are a kind of appearance. The likelihood of violence, vengeance, and bloodshed in a race war is an appearance, which is conjured up as a future possibility. Not even as a future possibility. He says it will happen. He doesn't say, well, I think it's likely. Right? When you want to press home a point, do you say, I think it's likely? No. One of the reasons why climate disruption has had such a tough go in many quarters in terms of acceptance is because, at times, scientists use the word uncertain about some of their results. If you're a scientist, who, who here is in the sciences? Anyone? Yeah. Are you ever willing to say something after one or two experiments is absolutely certain it's 100% sure? No? Why not? I'm shocked. Science has to be careful, doesn't it? Things such as probability mean a lot in science. What kind of probability would you like to have in experiments before you say something is highly likely? 95, yeah, that's, uh, that's what a lot of scientific papers rely on. Standard of 95% of the time when we did this, this is exactly what happened. So we can really expect that that is a high degree of probability for this. Ah, but now I say to you, oh, you mean there's some uncertainty involved? Yes or no? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. This can be done on almost any question. So you have to be extraordinarily careful. Because when a seed of doubt is planted with a word like uncertain or doubtful or perhaps not possible or we are not certain or we are not sure or we cannot be sure and you don't have a whole set of statistics to show this, at least not to the public. Very hard to pr constantly be presenting reams and reams of statistics to the public. What is likely to happen? What is likely to happen to any group of people if you start throwing lots of statistics at them? They might not understand it, indeed. A lot of people wouldn't understand P greater than 95. They'd look at that and they wouldn't know what it meant. Yeah, and after a while, people generally, are, are statistics aesthetically pleasing? Well, they can be, but generally speaking, if you look at a spreadsheet, you're not looking at it for aesthetic reasons. People like some kind of satisfaction. They like some kind of maybe even emotion involved with their argument. Statistics are extraordinarily helpful, but you can't always turn just to them, even in scientific matters. It's very hard to. So that little bit degree of uncertainty can be just enough, even if it's very small. So I now want to mention a couple of things that are on the outline sheet that I've handed out to stress about some of the qualities of rhetoric. And think about them in relation both to Douglas's address and also to the address that Clay gave, and in fact to anything we read this entire term. Rhetoric is a communal undertaking. It involves a large number of people often who are dissimilar quite frequently in their internal composition. That's a big challenge right away. Even in a small group, you very often will have violent dissension and disagreement. 
it's sometimes among like-minded people that you get the strongest disagreement. That is to say, there can be really vicious fights within one political party, or within one religious group, or within one group of individuals who have the same heritage. Those fights can be pretty sharp. But rhetoric is an attempt to create a sense of community that can then move in some direction of action. That they can, in fact, be persuaded of the desirability of a certain position. And this involves the willingness to go into, I believe, dissent and debate and dialogue. And people who are good rhetoricians are aware of the dissent and the debate that surrounds a question. It is, it's a word we haven't used much yet in the course, it is a form of communication. You have got to make yourself understood to a group of people who are not like yourself very often. They're not like yourself. They don't have the same background as you do. They see appearances in a different way than you see them. They look at a situation and they will interpret it in a different manner than you do. Do you ever have that happen to you? You look at something and think about it one way and look at a friend and thinks about it another way? Now, the back of your mind, your unconscious, has been thinking about something that you believed in once and now no longer do. Has anyone come up with something? Yeah. All right, Katie. Um, so I was actually recently watching um, a comedian named John Oliver, and so I don't. I actually, I'm not even sure whether the the thing that I don't believe anymore, I should not believe. I need to do more research on it. But um, I used to think, after watching lots of shows like CSI and um, like crime shows and just sort of general cultural knowledge that a lot of forensic science, including um, analyzing teeth marks um, and bite you know, imprints, was a viable way of determining whether someone had left, you know, had been at a scene. And according to this thing that I just watched, it's um, actually not that re reliable in terms of determining whether or not like those bite marks are maybe it's, it's not easy at all to analyze whether or not Yeah, I mean, this is true. I, you know, forensic scientists are very careful about their findings, and very often their findings come down to a degree of probability as well. So yes, when you, we see these TV shows in which they solve a complicated crime in 52 minutes or 49 minutes or whatever it is, and they get the test back right away, and they all fall in line, and we discover who did it, this is often not the way the world works. <laughs> or we had a case here in Massachusetts a few years ago. There had been many drug convictions in the state of Massachusetts. A number of people had been convicted, some of felonies, some had gone to prison. Guess what was wrong with some of those drug tests in the state drug lab? Two people had been tampering with them, and two different people on two separate occasions. And now the state of Massachusetts is faced with the possibility of voiding the conviction of thousands, thousands of individuals convicted of drug crimes. Now, I'll ask a tougher question. Are you sure all those people are innocent, therefore? No. Are you sure that Many of them are guilty? No. Are you sure of much of anything about the guilt or innocence of any one of those individuals? No. So, what should the decision be? Let them all go. Well, that's interesting, because then you're going to maybe be letting go some guilty people, right? But. Well, now that's another part of it. Yeah. Nonviolent drug offenders aren't a big deal. That's an interesting argument. That's an argument that certainly comes up in this situation. Indeed. Indeed. And then someone comes along and says, rightly or wrongly, yeah, but nonviolent drug offenses very often lead to violent offenses. A claim. This, let me say, this is the kind of atmosphere in which we live 
and make huge decisions about the lives of people. And those are hard decisions. They're very hard decisions. Are they always going to be perfectly just? No. It's very hard for them all to be perfectly just. Can you try to work to make them as just as possible? Yes. And that, indeed, is part of the job of rhetoric, to make things as just as possible by arguing for them. Otherwise, you may end up in a situation where someone says, well, we do this or this. Bingo. This or that. We'll do it quickly. Solve it quickly. So I mentioned last time, too, that in many cases, rhetoric has a temporal aspect, meaning an aspect in time. It takes a long time for things to change. When Henry Clay died, 10 years later, he freed all his slaves. Interesting. Did that make him a supporter of abolition? No, did not. Did a civil war occur? Yes. Did that solve the race problem in America? Oh, certainly not. Race issue in America is still a burning issue for the country. And it probably will be for the next couple generations. Who knows? I would say likely, anyway. So there is this temporal aspect to rhetoric that both with big questions over time, it has to work over time. As I read from W.E.B. Du Bois, day by day, bit by bit, it's got to be worked on. And then in an individual case, it has to be worked on too. Just to persuade someone of one bit may take a while. So there's a temporal aspect to it. And doing that over time supposedly helps sharpen judgment, helps us know a situation better, helps ameliorate the situation. Is the racial situation in the United States better today than it was in 1842? Yeah, I think so, I hope so. But that's a long time. Is it better today than it was 10 years ago? I don't know, that's a hard question. It is ethical, rhetoric is ethical, or it can be put to unethical ends. You considered Clay's speech an ethical speech? That's a hard question. Do you consider it an ethical speech? Let me put the question another way. Do you consider that Clay, as a speaker, has presented his own ethos well? Yeah, he has. That is not to be confused with the persuasion that he is putting forward as itself being ethical. Okay? That's a tough distinction to make, but it's an important one. Oh, it's a difficult distinction to make. Does that make Clay an ethical person because he has presented a certain ethos that is ethical within the confines of this speech? I don't know. I would say not necessarily. But don't forget that when you're reading or listening to something, you are forming an opinion of the speaker or writer based on the content before you. Now, you may know that person, and you may know that person's reputation. But by and large, that speech is effective, or it will f rise or fall by how you judge the ethos of the person in that performance, in that speaking. Because as soon as that ethos turns sour, that person has lost you. You're not going to support that person. But if that person has presented an ethos that you can at least respect, that gives that individual a chance to make their case. That's why ethos is so important. Ethos is, to put it this way, a necessary, good ethos is a necessary but insufficient grounds for the persuasion of an argument. You have to have ethos presented well. Otherwise, the likelihood of your winning over an audience is very small. But just because you have a well-presented ethos doesn't mean necessarily that you are going to convince people of your argument. But then, in a sense, rhetoric turns out to be a form of inquiry. It's a form of asking questions. It's not just a form of taking positions. 
It partakes of a kind of dialectic. Why is that the case? Is that really the case? Who says so? If that's an argument against me, how good is that argument? Let me examine it. Why do you disagree with me? What is the motive that this person has? Are motives important? I would hope so. Yeah, motives are important because motives show a person's ultimate goal. And sometimes people will do things that appear to be good in the short term, but their ultimate motive is to do something quite entirely different. There are phrases for this like pulling the wool over people's eyes or a scam. You know, things appear to be good. They look good. And very often, if they look too good to be true, usually they are false. But this sense of inquiry, this sense of moral examination, and let me put it even as moral self-examination, so that you aren't just a hired gun. You're there really, yes, to persuade, but you're there to examine before you persuade or to constantly examine as you persuade. So when, for example, we look at Abraham Lincoln and his career, we see that what Lincoln thought in the 1840s was not what he thought at the end of the 1850s. Why not? Events changed him. Experience changed him. It's a very sad person who is a moral agent or a rhetorician who is exactly the same at age 40 as they were at age 20. They haven't grown. They haven't learned anything about the world in the interim. They were cast like a statue, like this, and then nothing happens. Rhetoric is something alive in the person who actually conducts it, and not just at that moment, but the next day, the next week, and so forth. Is it OK for people in public life to change their view on a question? You're all nodding, but if you change your view on a question, what then? Can you be accused of? Flip-flopping. Flip yes, that's the word we hear all the time now. A flip-flopper. So-and-so flip-flopped on medical insurance. So-and-so flip-flopped on the budget. Um, so when you change your mind and change your mind honestly, you are opening yourself to that accusation. But you can then defend it. And this is part of the give and take itself of the rhetorical process. You have to be ready for that. because. Rhetoric presupposes, and this is something to you know, think about, real rhetoric, arguing for certain positions that you feel are important and contentious, presupposes that you will actually have an enemy. I don't mean someone nasty, but I mean someone who opposes you. And someone who's going to do whatever they can to defend their position. Is that OK? Yeah, I mean, that's an open society. It's a free society. That's deliberation. But it comes as a bit of a shock to find out that somebody really intelligent and really clever is going to use all of their verbal arsenal to say something that opposes you. Are you ready for it? Well, that requires some real self-examination. And then it requires some courage. It is aesthetic. We talked about that before. I won't go that into that again, except to say that it is not what the philosopher Kant calls pure aesthetic judgment. It's mixed. That is to say, it's mixed with moral questions. It's mixed with probability. It's not like uh, some abstract work of art or some presentation which is there just for your contemplation. It's messier, if I could put it that way, because it's involved with values and cognition and decisions and actions, but it is also aesthetic. So I would call it impurely aesthetic. It's not a work of art per se, but it has artistic qualities to it. It has a shape to it. And finally, rhetoric is contingent. What is meant by that? It rarely deals in absolutes. It rarely deals in realms that are transcendent. It may occasionally appeal to a transcendent force, to a deity, to certain values that seem to be long-lasting, or even in the minds of some people, eternal. But in general, the business of rhetoric 
is carried out in events and appearances that are probable or improbable and contingent. That is to say, something else happens in the future, it's going to change the chessboard. Things won't look the same. And that contingency means, especially when you are dealing with policies or problems that are stubborn and recalcitrant and long-lasting, that you will have to follow that contingency as it, as it occurs. It deals, therefore, with particulars and particular situations and not with what I would call hardened ideologies. Now, you can say, well, some, some hardened ideologues are pretty good speakers. Yes, but I don't think they're really practicing rhetoric at a very high level. They very often end up um, speaking about a rigid doctrine. Occasionally, some of the individuals who do that are quite successful, and they're able to sway large numbers of people. And if they do that on a basis that we think is not ethical or not well-reasoned or does not take into account dissent, we very often call them demagogues. They are able to sway large numbers of people, but in a way that does not seem very responsible. Does that happen? Yeah, sure it happens. A time-honored example in teaching rhetoric, and I will mention it because it should be time-honored example in teaching rhetoric is Adolf Hitler. Did he give speeches that galvanized large numbers of people? Yes, unfortunately he did. Take a look at some of the films of Hitler speaking and the thousands listening to him. Unfortunately, sadly. Could he electrify an audience? Yes, and he did. He had what the Germans called Fingerspitzengefühl, meaning he could sense an audience's reaction almost immediately. And he would then modulate his tone and his emphasis. He was a gifted speaker. So can it be done unethically? Yes, it can be. It can be. 